welcome to Conduct Her, where we are two sisters on a mission to amplify female voices on the podium. Join us as we interview leaders in the field of choral music, share resources, and build a community for current and future teacher conductors, all while exploring the gender divide. I'm Kira Starr. And I'm McKenna Stenson. And we are Conduct Her. Welcome everyone to the Conduct Her podcast. We are so excited to have Dr. Jennifer Senjin on with us today. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to be here with you both. So we um, have just the distinct privilege of having Dr. Senjin on today. And I got to meet Dr. Senjin back at Michigan State. Um, I was working on my summer master's and just through serendipitous moment, um, somehow got to experience a Saturday workshop where she led a session and I said, oh my gosh, I have to know this incredible woman. Um, it was just super inspirational um, and I've just been really grateful to learn from her and we're excited for you to learn from her today. And so here's a little bit about her professional background. So Dr. Jennifer Senjin is currently the Associate Director of Choral Activities at Georgia State University where she conducts the Women's Chorus and Choral Union and teaches graduate choral literature, graduate and undergraduate conducting, undergraduate choral methods, and in all of her free time, supervises student teachers. <laughs> Under her direction, the Women's Chorus won first place in the American Prize Choral Performance category, and Dr. Senjin received second place in the conducting division. The Women's Chorus recently performed at the Georgia Music Educators Association Conference in January of 2020. An active guest conductor, clinician, adjudicator, and presenter, Dr. Senjin has conducted honor choirs in Virginia, Georgia, Florida, New Jersey, Michigan, and New York, and presented sessions with the Dublin Youth Singers in Ireland, um, as well as the NAFME Eastern Division Conference, ACDA Central and North Central Division Conference, Georgia Music Educators Conference, Florida Music Educators Conference, and at the Virtual Mirabai Women's Leadership Retreat, among many other things. <laughs> Welcome again, Dr. Sunjin. Yay! Thank you both for um, having me and um, just for creating this really cool podcast that gets to feature, you know, women conductors in our field. I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, how this whole thing unfolds. We are too. We're very excited. <laughs> And we're especially grateful to our first season guests um, who have just been so willing to dive in. Um, and I feel like every time we record an episode, I walk away with just a newfound inspiration. Um, and I think that that's the goal for our listeners. So we can't wait to hear um, all of the things you're going to offer today. So Kira, do you want to dive in with our first set of questions? Absolutely. So our first question for you today is just tell us a little bit about your upbringing and how you came to choral music. So I, like many, started singing and um, playing instruments in elementary school um, in the school program. And that was something that my mom had really encouraged me to do because I think, she, you know, she'd heard us as children. I have a, a younger brother and we sang Disney medleys and all the things all the time at home. And so she was like, you need to be in these music ensembles at school. And so she really encouraged um, both of us to do that. And, um, and I really enjoyed my time. And then when I got into middle school, we had a new teacher that um, she wasn't new to teaching, but she was new to the school. Her name was Lisa Lepore. And um, she was really influential to me um, in, and uh, in my formative years. Um, and she was just somebody who had a different vision for what middle school choir could be. She had really high musical expectations, but also a really strong sense of vocal pedagogy and instruction um, for that age group. And so as a result, I got to sing some really incredible music with her. And because she had really high standards and the tools to be able to get us there, it was just such an elevated musical experience. And so that was really when I fell in love with, you know, being in a, in a choral ensemble, because it was just such a, um, a beautifully expressive way to, you know, connect with your peers and make beautiful music together. 
And then I, I sang all the way through high school and toward the end of high school, you know, everybody's applying for colleges and universities. And so at the time I, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do. So I had enrolled in a nursing program and, you know, and I thought, okay, well, this is, you know, I'll go do nursing. Um, and then when I was at the end of my senior year, the high school that I went to had a really cool program where they allowed some of the seniors, um, you could apply to, if you had a, a volunteer placement for the last few weeks of the school year. And I had seen that some classes prior to mine had gone back to like their middle schools and helped out and, and taught and stuff. And I thought, well, this would be great. I'll go back to Lisa Lepore and hang out there for the last three weeks of, you know, high school. And so I got there and I remember it was like the second or third day I was there and she just said, do you want to warm up the vocal ensemble? And I thought, well, yeah. And so it was one of those moments, like I got in front of the group and started giving some instruction that like the choir of angels went off in my mind. And I thought, this is, this is what I'm meant to do. Like I am, I am supposed to be, you know, facilitating music making and collaborating with people. And so it was at the, <laughs> at the end of my senior year, I was already enrolled in nursing school. Um, and I just thought I, I have to, I've got to change course. And so, um, I did, I went to, I went to nursing school for one semester and took a bunch of music classes and transferred after that second semester, um, in, into a, a bachelor's of music education program. But it was, I, it, that moment, and she had let me conduct at graduation. That was really when I was like, I cannot see myself doing anything else. I was just not as passionate about, you know, anything other than, you know, making music and singing and bringing other people along on that journey. Wow, that was a fantastic answer um, and sort of segues into so many of our other questions for today. Um, but I also just want to reiterate the power of middle school music and getting that solid start, you know, when you're in your formative years. Um, not all of us were lucky enough to have that experience. And so that's pretty incredible that you had such um, powerful musical memories from a young age and then to have that full circle mentorship to go back um, and to to seek inspiration from that person and then to discover, like you said, the choir of angels. <laughs> um, and I think that many of us have have that moment where it's where it is the realization and um, then we take it into self-actualization. So very cool. Um, to have that experience so young. So one of our next questions is what event or events was inspirational for you to choose music as your career? Um, and so obviously you had this moment, but was, was there something else along your way? Um, and maybe even beyond just music as a career, but seeking music in higher education um, that you could expand upon for us? Yeah. So um, I did my undergrad at the College of New Jersey, which is a small liberal arts college in the center of the state. And when I was there, I had the opportunity to, to work and be in front of several of the college's ensembles. And it was in working with those groups um, that I realized this is really what I'd like. This is the age level that I'd really like to be working with ultimately. Um, and I also knew at that time that it was going to be really important for me to spend time in the classroom, you know, in the K-12 classroom, really working on my skills, um, you know, not just as a conductor, but as a pedagogue, you know, looking at the conductor teacher model where you um, are are not only thinking about the overall artistic outcome, but all of the processes that you might consider, you know, on your way to that as well. So that the process is also um, a rewarding and enjoyable experience for our singers. And so I had some opportunities, as I mentioned, in undergrad, and, and that to me really solidified that I wanted to go right on and get um, a master's in choral conducting. And um, I, there's several philosophies about going right on for a master's, you know, after undergrad or, you know, waiting and teaching a few years. And I really think that um, there's no wrong way to do that. I think that everybody has, you know, their own journey and their own things that they were really looking to do. 
And so for me, coming right out of undergrad, I felt as though I really wanted a lot, um, a lot more practical skills that I would then be able to use in the classroom. And so I went to Ithaca College. I went up one weekend um, because I had heard about this tremendous conductor teacher, Dr. Janet Galvan. And I thought, well, I'll just come to a concert and it'll be really awesome. And I'll, you know, just get to meet her because at that time she was teaching a choral music experience course at Ithaca. And I thought maybe I'll go, you know, take that week long, week long summer course there. So I, I drove up and I went to her concert and it was incredible. And I just remember being so struck by the energy and enthusiasm um, and the beauty of tone and just the details and the overall expressive elements. I mean, there's more things to say, but of the ensembles that she was conducting. And I thought, I want to learn from this woman. Like, what is it that she's doing? How is she, you know, getting the ensembles to sing this way? Um, and I just felt like there was so much that I could gain from working with her. So I started taking um, conducting lessons. It was about a four hour drive from where I lived in New Jersey to um, Ithaca. And so I went up, I don't know, maybe every other weekend or something, I would just drive up, take a lesson and then drive back. Um, and she sort of helped prepare me for master's auditions and um and ultimately, I decided to go to Ithaca, and it was largely because I wanted an opportunity to learn from her. And so she was, you know, a huge inspiration. And, and my time at Ithaca was so formative for me as a conductor. And um, at that time, they took one student each year. So there was a lot of time to be running sectionals and teaching repertoire. And, you know, when the conductors would be out guest conducting and such, there was like a lot of podium time. Um, and a lot of individual attention that I felt was really very helpful to me. And also um, in that program, I had the opportunity to take an entire semester of orchestral conducting lessons and opera conducting lessons, which was just, you know, I, I look back at that now and think how fortunate I was to have had all of those experiences. Because when I left, I felt very prepared for, you know, lots of different musical opportunities. Um, you know, that I felt like I could be successful in those moments. So that was really, you know, she was really influential. And then I, I spent about five years teaching high school and I loved that time. And, you know, that's, that's when you really get to dig into processes and, you know, yes, you know, coming in with really high artistic expectations, but then more importantly, how are we connecting with our students? How are we teaching them, you know, the skills in order to be able to be successful in the repertoire and skills that they'll be able to carry, you know, outside of high school so that they may feel empowered, you know, to go on singing as um, an opportunity for artistry and expression in their own lives. And so, you know, I had, I, I feel really fortunate to have had, you know, time to, to do that. And then ultimately um, when I was looking at doctoral programs I wanted to have um, another model, you know, of, of a woman conductor that I, you know, might be able to relate with in a different way, um, you know, who would have had a journey that, you know, might be more closely reflective to the journey that, you know, I was embarking on. And so that was one of the reasons that I chose Michigan State, um, you know, as where I, I was going to do... Um, my DMA in choral conducting is because I had, you know, um, a really great opportunity to work with Sandra Snow, who's, you know, another dynamite conductor, um, high musical expectations, really engaged in the process, in the learning process and connecting with the ensembles. And so I knew that that was going to be, you know, complimentary and inspiring, um, you know, in the same way and also in different ways than my experience at Ithaca. And, uh, you know, Michigan State also has, you know, Dr. David Rail and an amazing choral literature sequence, which was something that I was really excited to dig into. Um, so it, that ended up being a really great fit for me. And um, something else that struck me about the, that particular program as why I made some choices about my own conducting journey is that there were 
a lot of women in the graduate choral conducting program. And I thought this is, and, and historically there had been a lot of women. And I thought this is, this is intentional. This is very intentional that, you know, this, the school has such a large community of women conductors and that they're supported. And, you know, the challenges that women conductors face might, are things that, you know, could be discussed and addressed. And um, so it was just a really warm and inspiring and energizing environment. And so I would encourage anybody who's listening to this and thinking that you might want to go on to a graduate degree somewhere, like find a place that resonates with you, with a teacher um, or teachers that um, you feel connected to and that will inspire you to be your best selves. Mm, Wow. Beautifully said. (laughs) I'm like, can I just go study with Dr. Jennifer Stenchen? This is, I'm already like feeling super inspired. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) Um, Yeah, that was beautiful. All right. So that was question number two, right, McKenna? Like I, yeah, beautiful. You kind of answered, like Dr. Stenchen has already predicted many of the things that we were planning to ask her and so beautifully segued into them. (laughs) Um, All right. So our last question, kind of opening question for you is who or what was helpful and influential in your journey? And you already talked a little bit about some of those mentors, but maybe there are some other people that um, you'd like to just give a shout out to. Yeah, I, you know, I think um, mentorship is really interesting because there are a lot of really, really exceptional teachers and conductors in our field And so I was always somebody who was really very aware of things that were happening and, you know, what programs were doing really well and teachers that had, you know, lots of student engagement and were making tremendous music. And so I was, you know, often visiting other schools and networking with teachers and and just trying to find, um, folks that I might engage in conversation and ask questions to. I mean, I remember being at, you know, all state choral rehearsals as a young teacher and just asking, you know, some of my amazing colleagues from New Jersey, like, how is it that you're recruiting, you know, tenors and basses, you know, or whatever the questions were just, you know, really looking for folks who were doing the work and doing it really well. And, engaging with them in conversation and getting a coffee and asking them about their career and how they came, you know, how they came to where they are and what is most inspiring to them. So I think in general, you know, I look at mentorship from that lens of like identifying folks that, you know, I want to learn from. I'm, I'm somebody who's like, just has an, an insatiable interest in learning and also socializing and connecting with people. So for me, that that is like that was a really great combination. Um, but I I just remember um, my the supervisor um, of music that I worked with when I was teaching high school, Jeff Lesser, just a tremendous supervisor and mentor. And you know, being able to go to him with you know questions about logistics and music and. I remember as I was thinking about recruitment, which is something that I'm really passionate about and I've had a lot of opportunity to practice now, but when I was learning how to to recruit in my first few years of teaching, I had a conversation with him and I said, you know, I'm really interested in, in growing this program and, you know, here are some of the challenges that I observed. And he said something to me about, you know, it's, it's sometimes tricky in large ensembles. Um, because there are so many students in the class that not everybody may feel connected to the teacher or that their contribution is really important. And, and if there are ways that we can engage our students and to make them to, so that they know how valuable their contribution is. Um, and that really sort of changed my whole philosophy on, on recruiting. And I, I mean, I knew how valuable I thought you know, each one of my students was and their fantastic contribution, but I wasn't necessarily communicating that. 
And, you know, as a young teacher, you're like learning to like, where do I put in attendance? How do I operate the grade book? Where's this office? Like I lost my ID. How do I get another one? There's like all these other things. Oh, there's a form for this I was supposed to fill out. Like, well, oops. So, you know, there's all of those other things. And it just, um, that was something that just really ignited, um, the idea of recruitment and connecting individually with my students. And so now I, I mean, I've practiced this skill a lot, but I really work to, you know, not just learn everybody's names, but, you know, some like um, asking students in, re you know, individually before rehearsal, how are you doing? What's going on with you? Like, and remembering things that, you know, they've told you before. So you can ask again, like, I remember you told me you took your dog to the vet. How's your dog doing? You know, like things like that, that seem really silly, but are actually so important to, you know, not only music making, but community building. And when your ensemble is connected and they feel connected to you and, you know, there's this free and open exchange of artistry and creativity. I mean, it's just a, an incredible environment and so, um, you know, so I think also about him and, you know, I, I just so many, I, I countless mentors, you know, that, I mean, fr friends that I have, colleagues from Michigan State, I mean, I call up people all the time. Oh, I'm programming for this. I'm looking for a piece that's, you know, such and such. And I mean, I must call Dr. Meredith Bowen from Radford University like once a week and just having general conversations about, you know, choral music or my friend. Um, you know, Dr. Amy Voorhees from Susquehanna, for example, and just, um, yeah, my tremendous colleagues that I got to meet at Michigan State. And so I think for me, mentorship um, is really learning from, you know, everybody all the time, you know, and, and taking it in. Mm. Wow. I'm, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kira and I are both like, yeah, we need a t-shirt for that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And so valuable to hear someone who, like, we are aspiring to be. We are aspiring to be just like you, Dr. Sunjin, say, you know, the learning continues and there is something to be gained from meeting people at the conference, making an effort to get a coffee with someone you don't know and putting yourself out there. I think that's something that can be overwhelming for people, but it is those connections that do give you a wealth of resources that you can call and say, you know, I absolutely loved meeting you. What are your thoughts on this? Or can we do a collaboration? Or, you know, is there some way we can stay connected musically? So that's, yeah, incredible to hear. You know, and that just, that also reminds me, this is something I talk about with the graduate students at Georgia State. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you know, you mentioned something about taking opportunities. And I, I always remind myself and my graduate students that, and the undergrads too, I mean, all the people, that when when you apply for something, you know, like a conducting masterclass or a workshop or, you know, things like that, it doesn't always go, you know, in your favor. But if you don't apply for those things, then you definitely do not get to do them. And so, you know, if you were to ask some of the most successful people in the field, you know, for the, you could see their list of accomplishments, like that's awesome. But the list of things that, you know, we like folks didn't get and things that didn't happen is much longer. And so I say that um, just to say that it's, you've mentioned um, Kira, putting yourself out there. And I think that's, a, that's a huge component too. Um, I, I'll say to ensembles, you know, like, no puppies ever were injured if a ensemble sings a wrong note. Like, you know, just like go for it or, you know, try to do this thing or sing this solo or, you know, apply for that conducting masterclass. You know, the worst thing that gets that happens is you don't get it. And then you look for another door, you know, look for the open door and walk through it. Um, but you you don't get there if, you know, if you don't if you don't try and you don't put yourself out there. And so, um you know, as hard as, you know, rejection can be, and we've all experienced that as conducting artists. Um, I think there it's are really many nods happening on the screen right now. Everyone's <laughs> going, yep. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, I think it's really important to, to continue. 
um, because there are doors that are meant for you to be opened or are meant to be opened for you. And sometimes the ones that you least anticipate um, are the ones that you end up walking through and it has a better outcome than you ever possibly could have imagined. We were talking to somebody on the podcast um, earlier who said, um, I just stopped making my five-year plan. Like I just stopped um, because every time I started like pushing out, you know, five, six years, I would end up walking through six or seven different doorways that took me to something that was even greater than I ever could have imagined, but was completely unexpected um, and not what I was thinking. Um, And that was really interesting to hear that from someone who I know is uh, an avid planner. So I was trying to take stock in knowing that rejection is a part of life. It's a part of growth. Um, And just the people who see those videos, the relationships that you build gaining a letter of recommendation or having to go through your own footage to pick out, you know, for example, if we're talking about connecting masterclass, just that self-reflection is priceless. And so you gain so much from just the process of trying to do the thing. Um, You talked a little bit in your answer about community building, which I think is something that's so key in my experience of watching you rehearse and direct um, or present. And it's something that I always feel from you. And and a a tool that I've seen you use before um, is Dal Crow's Eurythmics. And so I wondered if you could speak a little bit about where you encountered this and how you feel it impacts you as a conductor teacher, um, but also in terms of building community. Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, I think I just want to clarify that... um, I am not a scholar in Dalcros, but I, when I was at Ithaca, one of the conductors there, um, the director of choral activities at the time, Larry Dobler, um, was a scholar in Dalcros and studied with a Dalcros scholar. And so um, at Ithaca, between Larry Dobler and Janet Galvan, we did tons of movement, physical movement, to experience the music. And both of them did it um, differently. Um, and both in service to the music. And so uh, Larry Dobler used to, with the top choir, um, we'd have movement Fridays, and the entire rehearsal would be spent in a con- in our concert hall on the stage, you know, fully moving to the music as we were singing, whether it was stepping the pulse, stepping the notation, doing some sort of tableau, doing a mirroring exercise, he had a lot of different strategies um, that he that he would utilize based on you know the repertoire that we were doing, um, and then uh, Dr. Galvan used movement um, more frequently in rehearsals, and um, so and not necessarily for the entire the entire ensemble period, but it could be. And she was somebody who, or is somebody who utilizes movement to very efficiently teach pedagogical ideas, whether it's vocal technique or the musicality. Um, Maybe there's some challenging rhythms. And so everybody's going to physically experience, you know, the rhythm that you're doing. But I really, I learned from both of them about how important it is to connect your body to, um, to the music because our bodies are our instruments. And I remember hearing from Dr. Galvan, she would use the, the quote, you know, um, what our bodies do, our voices follow and because our bodies are our instruments. And so I learned so much in that two years um, at Ithaca about how to address issues, um, you know, musical issues and elevate the artistry using movement. And so I've, I use movement regularly um, I, I have done it for entire ensemble rehearsals, but more frequently I'll use different elements depending upon what's happening in rehearsal. Um, and so I think that there are some, some really, um, and by the way, it's not only Dalcros. So it's, you know, I, I describe my own personal practice as using movement and then some, um, movement that's inspired by Dalcros, but, you know, I might have the students, if they're singing a long phrase, I learned from Dr. Galvan to use a rope pull, um, which is essentially where you breathe in um, and you reach across, um, you breathe in at the beginning of the phrase, you face somebody 
And then it, like it's a tug of war, you both pull an imaginary rope through the duration of the phrase. And that really helps singers to sustain all the way through. And then when they get back onto the risers, they can re recall that physical sensation of pulling the rope. So I, um, I will often try to uh, utilize movement in a rehearsal, especially when I think it's going to um, help with rehearsal efficiency. You know, if we're doing a, a piece that's really highly rhythmic, you know, having everybody step the big subdivision in place and tap a, a, a tap, I'm sorry, step, you know, a bigger beat grouping and then tap the subdivision, for example. Um, even something as simple as that really helps the ensemble internalize the sense of pulse. And that is something that I, I feel is really essential um, in teaching is that the ensemble transferring the responsibility of beat from the conductor to the ensemble so that the conductor's role is facilitating and shaping the phrase and not as a you know metronome because I was finding when I was teaching high school in my first year or so you know as clear uh, as my beats were I was also clearly hearing the sounds of my beats <laughs> in the ensemble singing <laughs> and I was like well that's not really very helpful you know as I would listen I'm like I just heard beat three because I did a really pronounced beat three in the middle of this like legato piece. And so I, I think about that and I think the movement really helps to empower the singers to make musical decisions or it can um, and to be, you know, physically connected to the music. I often, for example, tell the ensembles that, you know, yes, I, I'm a musical artist, but I'm not the one making the music. They are making the music. They are, you know, the artists and I'm just a facilitator. And so I encourage them to make musical decisions, you know, even as we're sight reading, I might ask them to, um, just today I had a, a high school clinic this morning and I asked them to move in a way that was, you know, staccato so that then we could draw on that physical experience when we were, you know, looking at one of the repertoire choices that they had. Wow. That was such a great answer. We, we are both huge fans of using movement, both in rehearsal as a tool and also, you know, in performance, I think can be really powerful as well. Um, you know, transferring that concept onto the stage. And I loved how you said, you know, empowering the singers to kind of take ownership of the music in their own bodies. Like that is just something that is not necessarily at the forefront of all conductors' minds. And I think it's a really, really powerful way to look at the experience and help, you know, involve your community at, at the physical level. Like that is amazing. Um, switching gears a little bit, since you mentioned Georgia State, we thought we would ask you um, a question about being there, which is you're in a very unique position where both director of choral activities and associate director of choral activities are women at Georgia State. Can you speak to your experiences of partnering with another woman and talk a little bit about what it's like to be on a female team and how you lift each other up? That's a great question. I think that's one of my favorite components of teaching there is that I have a really tremendous colleague in um, Deanna Joseph. Um, she has built an incredible program there and is, I, I've been aware of, you know, her career we met in 2009 and I've been aware of her as a conductor teacher um, for some time. And, you know, I've really admired her work. And so when this position opened up, it seemed um, it was really attractive to me because I thought, again, I'm somebody who really appreciates, you know, having female colleagues and mentors and collaborators, because I think we do learn from each other. And she and I are both very intentional about that and, you know, supporting each other as colleagues. Um, and I think, you know, um, our, our graduate students talk about that as well. I mean, just the other day, somebody had mentioned that to me that, um, you know, they, they were really excited to have an opportunity to work with, you know, a program that has two women conductors in it. And I mean, I know as somebody who looked, you know, at that when I was looking for my own program, but I just, it's very, 
it was very impactful to hear that, you know, in on the flip side. And um, so anyway, we work great together. Uh, there'll, there'll be times where, you know, uh, we collaborate together, we'll do projects together. Um, we both teach lessons to the graduate students. I teach the combined undergraduate graduate conduct choral conducting course. She teaches conducting seminar. Um, they'll students will come to us with questions that, you know, they'll ask both of us the same question or they'll ask different questions. And there's um, a, a very high level of respect for each other's work. And I think that is really important, you know, in your colleague, but also I'm very grateful for that. Um, and so there'll be times where she'll defer to me or I'll defer to her. And, you know, depending upon, you know, the situation. And I think though we've studied, you know, in different institutions with different teachers, I think there, we have a lot of similarities as far as our desire to, you know, help our students any way we can to, to learn and grow and to provide, you know, an artistic and fulfilling and nurturing and positive environment for, you know, our ensembles and our conductors and our conducting students that are there. And so that's, you know, that's been a, a really great joy. And, you know, we cheer each other on for things. And I mean, they just sang at, you know, ACDA Southern and were the university singers under her direction and they were tremendous. And so, you know, among many other things. So that's, um, yeah, it's, it's been really, really wonderful. It's pretty incredible to hear you speak to this and to, um, we will be having Dr. Joseph on the podcast later in this season, which is pretty amazing that we get to hear from both of these female leaders at Georgia State. Um, and as someone who attends a university now that does have um, a dynamic team and everyone on the team is integral to the success and is, inc is, and is incredible, um, but I do see two females who are very different um, taking great leadership roles and supporting each other and collaborating in a way that is inspirational to me um, because I have been a part of, of um, teams before with women that wanted to bring other women down. And I think that that doesn't do any service um, to anyone. And it's um, it was more painful to me, honestly, to have a person um, in a team that I used to work in um, at the county level just to be belittling um, and cruel to each other. And I think that it's just so inspirational to see um, positivity coming from a place um, like your relationship at Georgia State. And just in general, I hope this podcast can be a resource for people to know that this is a space for women to lift up women um, and not to tear women down, which is sometimes the case. You know, I, I also appreciate that you mentioned that because I think that goes hand in hand with some of the ideas of mentorship that I'd mentioned. You know, um, I would, and anybody listening to this, you know, find your people, find the people that you are, connect with that do lift you up, that encourage you to be a better version of yourself every day, you know, that can be your mentors and your sounding board that it help to infuse positivity into your life um, and into your work. Because there are, you know, in any field, there are those folks who work against those goals that we might have. And so just, you know, not taking those, you know, interactions personally and just really gravitating toward the people that are, are going to lift you up and then finding ways to lift others up as well and celebrate their successes, which I think is a really huge thing. Um, you know, I, I am somebody who gets really excited when my friends get things and <laughs> I don't know, I get more excited sometimes, <laughs> but, um, because I feel like, you know, if they, what's there, there's some sort of phrase that's like, you're some percentage of, you know, who you spend your time with. And I feel like if we're all, you know, lifting each other up, then we're all benefiting and we're all learning and we're all growing from that experience. Um, and there's, there's a place for everybody who would like to make music in our field. And so I think so much of that is also, you know, outlook. Mm. Yes. And, oh, go ahead, Kira, your turn. I was going to say, <laughs> I feel that so much because, um, you know, I have had people say to me before, that must be so challenging to like have your sister be so successful and like come from a family 
of musicians who have had these experiences and like, and I, my response is always like, no, it, it's not challenging. It's, it's a resource and it's inspiration and it's there. Yeah. Her success is my success. Like I feel like I am her biggest cheerleader and like when she succeeds, it, it's a win for all of us. And I, I don't know. I just, I'm always kind of confounded by that. I'm like, she's just pushing me to work harder and she's opening doors that I didn't know existed and, you know, just continues to be a positive light in my life. And her successes do not mean that I too will not succeed. We both can. Yeah. And I also, there, it reminds me, I think I heard this phrase from Dr. Galvan, but it was something about, you know, when one, even though one person's light's shining, doesn't mean that it, your light's not also shining. Um, or it was something like that. I'm sure she, if she listens to this, she's going to say, that's not exactly what I said, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that was the sentiment. And I just, um, you know, I think about that too. Like if somebody else has success, you know, fantastic. And then you look for the doors that open for you. I mean, I, I was not expecting, you know, to, graduate school and be teaching in Atlanta. I mean, I don't, you know, 10 years ago, I mean, I've no, I didn't, I don't even know what I was thinking I was going to do at the time, but, you know, seeing like it, it, life doesn't always take you where you expect to go. And if you're open to the things that come your way, I mean, that's something that I've really learned um, from my friend, Amy, she's had a lot of success in her own, you know, in her own person um, conducting life and professional life. And it's like, she just goes where the doors open. And I, that's so inspiring to me. You know, it's like not, I don't need to like break down the cement wall to create my own door. Like there's three other doors I can walk through. So, you know, I, I just think about that. Something we talk about in the cohort right now a lot um, that I'm a part of is this uh, mindset of scarcity versus abundance. And I think what you talked about with the light um, really resonates in that sphere of just because one person is succeeding doesn't mean that you can't and that there are hundreds of thousands of opportunities out there. They just might not look like what you thought they would look like. Um, and oftentimes those experiences have been more informative to me and my personal growth and my growth in relationship with others than things that I thought oh, this is the path. Like, this is it. I have to do A and B and C and D, and then I will achieve success. Um, And so I think this is a great reminder to all educators out there (laughs) that it's not just for us personally, but also for our students. Success comes in all different packages. And um, there's a lot out there um, that is unexpected that is part of growth. Um, This kind of goes into something that you... um, mentioned in describing the many courses that you teach at Georgia State. Um, your load is incredible, Dr. Senjin, and I you know, would love to be a part of some of those classes that you've mentioned. One of the things that you talked about was supervising student teachers. And so I'm wondering if there's um, some advice that you might be able to share for whether it's future music educators or current music educators in our field that you think is pertinent, especially to right now. That's a really great question. <clears throat> I think now is a, a really tough time for teachers, especially that we're sort of in this tail end of the pandemic slash turning into an endemic situation. Um, and just the challenges that, especially the K-12 educators, I mean, it's been challenging for everybody, but I just really, I just have such a heart for our K-12 educators who have, you know, been in the trenches through so much of this pandemic. Um, You know, I think for student teachers, I think what is most helpful is to go into the classroom experience with an energy and enthusiasm that you are excited to work with the students and excited to teach. And that will be a huge guiding point for you and your students will see your, you know, your interest in them and your interest in teaching and the interest in the content. 
I mean, I tell my current student teachers now, you know, obviously, you know, you need to be prepared and know the music inside and out and, you know, have your rehearsal strategies and the best laid plans. But, you know, to be prepared to pivot and to really be listening to your students and, you know, making adjustments on the fly. And then I would also say that teaching is challenging and especially, you know, for student teachers and first year teachers, I mean, it's not easy. And if it's, I had a teacher once um, say to me, it was somebody who I had at the College of New Jersey, that if you're not having a hard time at some point during your first year of teaching, like you're doing it wrong. Because if then I thought, what does that mean? Well, then I did a first year of teaching and I was like, oh, I get what that means. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, it means that you like, it's because you really care and you really want to do a great job. And so it's not always going to come easy because you're, you know, you're working with people and they're complex, you know, at, and, you know, um, whatever age you're teaching. And so I think, you know, just understanding that, you know, sometimes we're going to prepare the best lessons and struggle to execute them perfectly. And sometimes something that we think isn't, you know, going to be great, like ends up being fantastic. And something that works well for your first period class is like, doesn't work at all for the next period. <laughs> That's the same class. And just, you know, to use those as opportunities for self-reflection and self-improvement and not, um, you know, as an opportunity to beat ourselves up you know, looking at ways that you can pick up and move forward. You know, if a lesson didn't go well, the, it's not helpful to sit there and, you know, all our negative self-talk about this was terrible. And uh, it's like, okay, what did not go well? Okay, what strategies can we use to make that better? And so I encourage, you know, my student teachers to look at that and also to utilize all of the resources that they have. They will, you will not go out there and know all the things. I don't know all the things. Nobody knows all the things. I mean, it, you can't know all the things. So, you know, you've got a cooperating teacher, you've got university supervisors, you've got your peers, you've got your former teachers. You know, if you go to, if you go to conferences and network with folks, or you go to other schools, con concerts and meet those teachers, like, there are so many in the field who are interested in helping you to learn and grow and be better. Um, you know, utilize those things. It's not, it's not a, a sign of weakness to, to admit that you're having challenges, you know, with classroom management in your eighth grade class, for example, I'm making it up. Um, you know, ask somebody about that. It's a, I feel personally that it's a sign of strength that you recognize this is not going well. I would really like this to be going better for my for my students, for myself, and seeking out that guidance um, so that you can continue to be the best version of you that you can be for your students. Mm, I feel that's so hard. I literally called McKenna yesterday crying <laughs> after my rehearsal because um, I had had a rehearsal on Tuesday. It was amazing. I was like, I'm such a boss. I nailed it. My plan was perfect and I executed it brilliantly. And then it Friday happened and I was like, that was horrible. But then I had a professor there who came up to me and said, you have made so much progress since last year and proceeded to give me like so much positive feedback. And I was like, yes, it's okay that like the plan did not happen exactly as I had wanted it to. And do I wish it had gone differently? Absolutely. But were there also some successful moments in there? Yes. Like, <laughs> and just because one moment was not perfect does not mean that we are not still powerful and engaging and just doing our best. We're all humans. So, and yeah. we're working, I was going to say, we're working with humans and humans feel differently based on the weather and whether <laughs> spring break is the next day. Um, or, you know, when I was teaching high school, I my chamber ensemble met right after lunch and normally somebody broke up during lunch or, you know, like got some sort of devastating news during that always lunch was, I was like, lunch is bad. We must have lunch, but this is terrible. And, you know, they'd come in the room and, you know, 
okay, well, this was plan A. We're going to need to go to plan X because none of these people can be in the same space together right now. Let's do partner work. (laughs) So just uh, the flexibility that you spoke to is so key because we're in the business of people more so even than the business of music. Absolutely. Changing, changing gears slightly, (laughs) um, (laughs) but still having to do with this topic of being a human vulnerability. um, Just would you possibly share a time when you felt discrimination in our field? And um, if you have a specific thing that you can think of, or maybe just like a microaggression or I don't know, it, that's a lot to unpack, but take a minute and kind of resonate on any time when you may have experienced some discrimination, um, particularly related to your gender. And um, what suggestions do you have to kind of overcome this type of adversity? And that was one of the reasons we started this podcast was because we felt there was a need to have these conversations and bring to light some of the experiences that we've all had to go through. And we want to make this field and the world just a better and more open place. So um, it, this, it's a really interesting question. Um, because I feel like if you were to ask any woman conductor, um, you know, they'd have, they'd have some stories about, you know, times that were challenging. Um, I think for me, rather than a specific story, I, I think about, um, I think about the fact that I sometimes, uh, have felt, especially when I was a young teacher teaching high school, that there were assumptions that were made because of my age or my gender that was that would underestimate my abilities or my skills without knowing, you know, who I am or what my strengths are or my weaknesses without really knowing anything about me. I feel like there were assumptions um, I just experienced that some folks made assumptions about that. And I found that to be really frustrating because, um, you know, if people make assumptions about you without knowing, you know, who you are as a person or your values or, you know, um, your goals or your experiences, it's really hard to challenge that. Um, And so what I, or in the moment, you know, because that's, those are not things that you're necessarily responsible for. Um, And so what I found to be really successful in those situations where I felt some sort of discrimination, whether that was, you know, gender-based or ageist, um, is I just still try to really just do my best work. And that it's understanding that it is okay if, you know, not everybody, you know, is rooting for you, you know, we go through school and we think like, oh, our, you know, our teachers are really, they're rooting for us and our peers and all of that. But sometimes when you're in the, in the world, there are those who may not feel that way, even if you feel that way about them and their work. Um, And I think McKenna, you alluded to this um, in your own experience. And so, I think it's it's okay to sort of let those things go and to just let your work speak for itself and to just do your own work and um and give your best with all of the integrity that you have because um you know uh I'm trying to think about the best way to I'm trying to think about how to articulate this but you just not everyone's going to like you and not every, you're not going to win everybody over and that's okay. And that doesn't really have anything to do with your skills or your abilities or, you know, sometimes it's just not a fit and, and that's okay. So you find your people and you hang with them. And then you, like I said, you go through those doors that are open 
The other thing that I found has been really helpful too, is that when there have been assumptions, you know, when I've encountered situations where, you know, there have been assumptions that were made that were not accurate or true, I just work to get to know those folks so that they actually knew who I was and, you know, what I valued as a person and, you know, would tell jokes or whatever, you know, um, to, to build my own rapport with folks. And I, I found that that was really helpful too. Mm, that's such a great answer. Yeah. I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Like not everyone is going to like you and people are going to make assumptions and what can be really powerful is your reaction to those situations. And sometimes it might get you activated and you might need to walk away and take a breath. And other times you might just be like, no, I'm amazing. I'm just going to go do this and, and just continue to, you know, show up and do my best. So absolutely. We talk about that um, on the podium as well. And I think that when you're, when you're a conductor, a, music, a choral music educator, a teacher conductor, sometimes, especially um, I think when I was a younger teacher, I think back and I think there was such a desire on my end for my students to like me. You know, and obviously I want my students to like me. I, I want to be, you know, liked. That's just something that is an innate part of my personality. And I understand that. I do, however, think through growth and through some of the things that you just said, I know I can still be an effective teacher, mentor, role model um, in person, even if I am not liked by all of my students, I can still be a good teacher to them. Um, and that's kind of what I had to do in that situation that I sort of alluded to earlier, just to um, work with integrity and to teach everyone um, as equitably as possible or to work with people as equitably as possible, whether or not we're best friends or not, we still have a task to do and there's a task at hand and that can be done. Um, even if not everybody in the room is recognizing, oh, this is my best friend. It doesn't need to be that. There just needs to be mutual respect. I completely agree. Well, Kira, do you want to dive into our fast five for today? I would love to. So we end our podcast each time by asking a fast five. So uh, five questions, whatever comes to mind first is the right answer. Don't think too much about it. Um, and our first question is, what is uh, your favorite or just something that's really speaking to you, octavo or composer that you have in mind right now? Favorite octavo or composer? So right now, um, I'm really into Kevin Johnson's arrangement of um, Go Where I Send Thee. Kevin Johnson teaches at Spelman College and this um, Spelman Glee Club. And it, it's, ama it's an amazing piece. It's been stuck in my head <laughs> for several days. So I would say that one. And also... Um, God Will Give Order a Sweet Child by Sarah Quartle. That's something else. The, the treble choir is singing that now at Georgia State, and it's just so catchy. And yeah, that one's in my mind. Amazing. Great answer. Sorry, I'm, I'm just over here, like, taking notes. I'm programming. <laughs> I'm programming as we're going. Um, amazing. And I also just want to shout out that how cool that both of those are pieces for treble choirs. I know you're working with treble choirs at Georgia State. Um, but it can be um, challenging to find good treble rep, um, as we talked about with a couple other people on the podcast. So what a wealth of knowledge. And we're going to we're creating a playlist um, from people's recommendations to share out. So, um, Dr. Sanjin, would you share one common misconception about you? I don't know if it's a misconception, but I really, I use a lot of humor and I think that that's sometimes surprising. What a great like, answer. <laughs> Sorry, you were going to expand. <laughs> for those who don't know me, as somebody in my church choir reminded me, you know, my jokes don't always land, but I do try. <laughs> I, and I use humor a lot in rehearsals and um, I, I think that's something that is, yeah, is not always expected. Love that. All right. Question number three, what is one word to describe you on the podium? 
I think energetic. Mm. I totally concur. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Um, what is one of your favorite coral memories? I don't know. That is such a hard question. I know. We were like, this really isn't fast. Our no, bad. that's not really a <laughs> <good> question. <laughs> I mean, I remember one of my favorite first choral memories was when I was in eighth grade when we sang in an octet in eight parts for our graduation. And I think back to that now and I'm like, oh my gosh, I was like 12 singing <laughs> a little octet. Um, which that was just a a real high point. But I mean, I just feel like I've had so many high points, you know, I've been in so fortunate to be in great college and university programs. And, you know, I, I don't know if there's one particular one, but I think my favorite choral moments are when you're just so overtaken by the artistry and the music that you there's not really a separation between yourself and the music and the expressivity. I think those are my favorite moments and, you know, they happen, they've happened more than once. Um, but, but definitely in those moments, whether, you know, regardless of the repertoire or where you are. Mm. That's a great answer. (laughs) You're crushing the fast five. I was very fast at the five, but <laughs> <laughs> well, there's one more. This might take a moment or it might be immediate. Um, do you have a coral blooper? So some moment that happened that may have been embarrassing <laughs> or uh, just didn't go the way you planned. Um, anything that comes to mind is the right answer. <laughs> You know, sometimes like just those moments where like something comes out of your mouth and you're like, ah, that I can't take that back. Where it's like, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> like <laughs> where you discover it like in the moment and you're like, ah, well, okay. And then you all laugh and move on, you know. And there's, especially having taught high school, where like, you know, when you say the letter names or you say the word pitches, or, you know, anything like that where it's like there's just so many opportunities for giggles that, you know, I I have certainly participated in inadvertently saying many of those things. So I, I think those are, those are the most for bringing that up because you'll have to go back and listen <laughs> to my blooper, but uh, it is very much related to that. And <laughs> I will never forget it. Truly. Um, one of my most special high school memories was, was that day. So you'll have to go back and take a listen to that, <laughs> to that particular blooper. <laughs> well, it has just been an absolute joy um, to get to talk to you today, Dr. Senjin. And I know that there is so much, um, to unpack in this podcast for our listeners. And I've got like a little notepad out already with ideas for Monday, um, which is, I think though, you know, a big part of what we're trying to create here is a resource for people, um, whether you identify as female or not, uh, just to know that this field is inclusive and hopeful um, and full of advice from mentors um, and friends. So it's just been an absolute pleasure to get to speak with you today. Yes, it's uh, me too. I I am I'm just grateful for this opportunity, and thank you both for creating this podcast. I'm looking forward to uh, listening to many more iterations. And if you haven't seen us, um, we are on social media, so please check us out. We are at conduct.her.pod on Instagram and conduct.her on Facebook, and we hope you tune in next time. Thanks so much for listening. This has been. Conductor. Conductor.